My name is Andrew Simpson, and today I'll be uh, discussing uh, a topic that's close to a lot of the work that we do here at the uh, university and that I've been involved in over the years. And the topic being, eat, drink, and be healthy. So, looking at alternate ways uh, to weight management other than dieting. So, what I like to do is start today with a guided exercise that we use with some of our clients that come into the clinic. You'll see there that I've got up um, a mandarin. At the last moment I've been told that that's been changed to a strawberry. So you should be getting some strawberries coming out to you now. So before you eat it, just hold on a second. Once it's out on your table, I'll just go through this. So while the, the strawberries come out, I'll just give you a little bit of a background on myself. So I'm a dietitian here at the university that uh, supervises the student at our health clinic um, on campus. Uh, my background is uh, a range of things, but in dietetics, I've worked with eating disorders, I've worked with uh, children that are obese, that are required hospitalisation, and I've worked with cystic fibrosis and, another, and general dietetics. So hopefully we've got some of the strawberries out. I know they're tempting, they look good. So hopefully this won't take too long to get them out. So what today's discussion or lecture talk is about, um, it, it's based on the evidence that's currently around, as well as some of the things that we see in the clinic uh, with our clients, and some of the practical things that we use that we've had success with, with the clientele that we see. So there'll be some evidence-based um, recommendations in there, as well as some of the clinical things that we do, some real practical things that you can do at home, um, and you can, things that you, you can incorporate in your life on an ongoing basis. So I think we get in there. We've got a couple more tables that uh, need a few strawberries. So those people that have their strawberries in front of them, um, before we even get into this exercise, you can see that uh, your strawberries come in ranges of sizes, shapes, <laughs> colours, um, and that's certainly something that is is part of this exercise that we're going to go through. So um, while it's tempting to eat it, we'll say hold off just for another minute. The other thing that I'd um, like to point out today is that today is not about individual assessment. That. I'm not trying to, to look at everybody's diet individually. So there's some, so there's some broad guidelines that have been successful with our clients um, and also, as I said before, with the, the evidence. So I'm sort of scratching a little bit for time at the moment, hoping that these, <laughs> these uh, strawberries will make it out on the table a little bit more. Okay, so what I might do is um, we might just go through this slide and get onto the overview of what today's talk's all about and then we'll come back. So, unfortunately I have to go through all of my slide to get onto it. So basically what I'd like to go through today is an introduction and some background on um, overweight and obesity. Uh, some of the contributors to weight gain and um, there are a lot. I don't think I would cover every single one of them, but certainly some of the major contributors. And energy balance in itself, and then have a discussion about that. Uh, looking at dieting and fat dieting, looking at healthy eating and drinking, and as I said before, some of the strategies uh, to assist with weight management, and um, looking at some strategies for weight reduction. And then finally finishing with a summary. So just while, 
while you're on straw because it's still coming out. I might just go through the introduction, but as I said, it's taking a little while. So, in Australia, the weight loss in industry is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So, last year, in 2010, um, it was estimated that there was spent $780 million on um, things like counselling, diet food shakes, you know, cookbooks, um, diet programs, weight loss programs, you know, supplementation and surgical interventions. And as you can see from this slide, uh, this slide was in from the WHO data in 2005, which indicates that um, Australia is not landing too far behind the US for incidents of overweight and obese. More recently, in 2007-2008, National Health Survey indicated that there was 61% of the adult population over the ages of 18 um, that were overweight or obese. So the numbers are quite staggering when we look at it on that. How are we going with those strawberries? Anybody? <laughs> Um, 
and using that on a daily basis. So certainly, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So I've gone through the introduction. Um, as I said, there's a lot of money spent on uh, weight loss industry. Um, and similarly, there's a lot of money that's spent on research into the causes of you know, overweight and obesity as well. Just pick up on the, the contributors to weight gain. And by no means is this list um, all inclusive. So genetics do play a part um, in body weight regulation, and researchers have found that uh, this this is the case. However, genes only explain a small part of variation in body weight. So there's other things that are affecting um, birth factors. We've looked at in research and studies suggest that you know that the mode of birth can impact on overweight and obesity. Um, there's, there's other things around nutrition in utero that can affect overweight and obesity. Um, certainly eating more energy than you use is one of the theories around overweight and obesity, and that um, is, has a lot of other aspects to it as well. So, you know, satiety is a big issue, and it can relate to why you eat more than any expenditure. The, the food that you eat, how it tastes, if it's yummy, you usually eat more of it. Um, portions that people consume have all been indicated. And also eating in the presence of others, which you'll all experience today, as you're all sitting here. Um, inactivity has been linked with weight gain and overweight and obesity. Um, modern living, socioeconomic factors, metabolic disturbances, um, things like um, hormone dysregulation, thyroid problems, um, can be those issues associated with that as well as things like body image, self-esteem. So there's a whole range, as you can see, it's, it's quite a complex area to, to the areas that contribute to weight gain. So what I would like to talk about is energy balance. Certainly that is in the literature a lot. And, um, and one of the, for, for all the scientists here, the, the law of thermodynamics states that energy can ne neither be created or distorted, it can only be converted from one form to the other. So in simplistic terms, energy in and energy out. And certainly that is one of the, the theories behind weight gain. However, I don't think it's that simple. We'll discuss that. So what are the things that contribute to energy in? So your food and and we'll talk about that and the energy that we expend, uh, the heat, muscle activation, our activity level, stored energy. And in um, some instances, uh, activity can be up to 20 to 40% of the, the energy that we expend. So voluntary activity or exercise. So one way to combat the energy in is dieting. And Rick Kausman has, in his book, um, If Not Dieting Then What, puts dieting like this. There's um, D standing for deprivation. Um, certainly every person that I've seen in a clinic that has failed a diet has come in and said that they found it quite depriving of the foods that they like. Um, Certainly, when you look at diets, they become quite impressive. Lots of weight gain in a short period of time. Uh, energy zapping, sapping um, is certainly reported, and they're usually temporary. They don't usually last long term. So looking at why they don't last long term, we look at the diet cycle. And this is certainly reported quite often. Start on the diet, 
go into restriction, deprivation, uh, get cravings for the thing that you're depriving yourself of, fall off the wagon or give in, end up quite guilty and then start it all over again. However, looking at that, there's some costs of, that happen physically. I'm sorry, you missed out on that. I'm kidding. You're giving that? Yeah. I'm trained. You're trained? Excellent, thank you. So, from the diet, the impact is on um, physically looking at <coughs> losing lean body tissue, decreasing metabolism, uh, ending of the diet going back to the usual way that you were eating before you started the diet, gaining weight again, and the cycle continues. Certainly that's what we see a lot of in the clinic. So as I said, there are physical and there is a psychological cost um, to restriction. And there was a, a classic study done in the 1940s, which was a starvation study that looked at um, restricting and depriving healthy individuals of kilojoules and energy and putting them in, into that starvation um, mode. And what they found out of that, which was quite interesting, was that a lot of the symptoms and signs that these individuals reported are very much like the signs that we find in the usual diet and cycle. So they were things like irritability, anybody that's been on a diet would know about that. Mood swings, lack of libido, food obsession. So in this study, they basically took people, healthy males, and put them as if they were in a um, concentration camp basically lost a lot of weight. After that period, what happened was they refed them and the problem was that these symptoms and signs continued to take place. So that food obsession um, and that unhealthy food obsession still continued even after they went back to their normal diets for years after. So why I'm bringing this up is certainly one of the things that we do find with people that have been on this diet cycle is some of those behaviours stay for a, a lot longer after the event. So why are diets likely to fail? Well certainly most diets only focus on one to two areas to change. So they might look at restricting fat for example, they might look at counting calories or they might look at a whole range of um, individual things, taking out a whole food group. So when I was looking, um, just a, as a quick search on the internet, and you can do this yourself, I, I thought I'll just go and see what the number of diets there are out there at the moment. And I, I stopped searching after 500. So over 500, so you could basically do one every day of the week for the next year and a half. So there are a lot of diets out there, fad diets especially, contributing to um, restriction primarily is what, what we're saying. So as I was saying before, there's a whole range of things contributing to behaviours that lead to weight gain. So by only focusing on one or two areas um, to change, then they're destined to fail. As I was saying, deprivation, starvation, you know, looking at the outcomes of those um, that I highlighted before. So certainly it's, it's important and, and what we'll look at today is some of the alternatives to dieting. So I'd like to come up with this approach. I'm, I'm pretty sure some people will have seen this. Um, some people may not have seen this, but this is the guidelines from the Australian uh, NHMRC for Australian adults. So it is the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, and certainly we'll explore that a little bit more. So what is healthy eating? 
So healthy eating means enjoying your food. Hopefully you enjoyed your entree. Um, and it's having a wide variety of foods. So this is quite easy to sort of say, but what, what does that look like? So a whole range of foods should be incorporated into your daily intake. And that, that would include you know, vegetables, fruit, you know, legumes, meats, cereals, dairy, um, and the consumption of water. As well as having some of those extra foods, or sometimes foods as people like to refer to them, or um, depending on where you come from, bad food. <laughs> so certainly incorporating some of that into your healthy eating is essential. So looking at the diet model, where you're restricting the sometimes foods or the bad foods, as a lot of people will come into the, the clinic and um, point out, should be looked at and enjoyed in a, in a healthy eating environment. That's certainly something that we try to promote. Healthy drinking is another side of the healthy eating part. And that's certainly because you know our bodies are made up of over 60% water and we need to make sure that they're kept up, kept hydrated throughout the day on a daily basis. So whatever we lose through breathing, through perspiration, lactation, um, we need to replace. And certainly there is evidence that alcohol and caffeine can increase it. However, there is some research that says <coughs> people that drink it regularly don't necessarily have that um, effect. So it can it can increase your demand for fluid consumption. So where do we get our fluid from? Usually we get it through our food. So we did get a reasonable amount of fluid through the foods that we eat and also how we consume our, uh, our drinks. So the general guideline for adult Australians, healthy adult Australians, is um, 1.5 to 2.5 litres, which is around 8 glasses, 250 mils a day. And I know certainly we see a lot where people come in and they might not be actually consuming that and that's just something quite simple that we can improve on that makes a difference to that individual. One of the things that um, has been shown in the literature, especially around satiety and fullness, is that fluids don't actually have the same effect um, as what food does on satiety. So sometimes consuming fluids that are quite high in energy can contribute to weight gain or excessive energy intake. So it might not directly relate to weight gain, but certainly looking at excessive energy intake. And alcohol consumption is one of those things. And certainly there are some recommendations around the guidelines of alcohol consumption. And I always like to do this whenever I'm presenting about um, alcohol, because I love to grab a wine glass and I'll start pouring and somebody can tell me when to stop. So I'd just like to know what is a standard drink. Let's say red wine. We use red wine today. <laughs> and um, whenever you feel like telling me to stop, just one standard drink. Word. Wow. Somebody said word. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, if I'm in a restaurant and like that, I'd be pretty annoyed. That's, that's probably slightly under the standard drink. I'll keep going. Let's see how we go. Okay, that's probably just above. So, in between that, whenever you go out to a restaurant, though, has anyone ever got a glass of wine about that size? No, I don't think so. You'd be pretty disappointed if you did. So what I wanted to highlight in that was what are the guidelines? A lot of people don't know what the guidelines are for alcohol consumption in Australia um, for healthy men and women to reduce your risk of injury and associated uh, disease associated with um, alcohol consumption to standard drinks. I don't. So really we're already one and a half on that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's not a great deal. So I guess that's the point that I'm making. You don't really need to have a lot to make the standards. And again, drinking no more than four standard drinks in one single sitting. So again, that's um, not even a quarter of a bottle of wine. It's not a great deal. So that could be one of the issues. So I'll just highlight some of the, the standard drinks there. So as you can see, for wine, it's only 100 ml. So it's really it's only two medicine cups worth. So I just wanted to change the topic off the, the healthy eating side of things and look at the other side of the equation, looking at activity. And certainly, the, you know, the guidelines um, for overweight and obesity look at activity as one of the things that can, can assist with weight reduction and um, weight maintenance. So certainly, if, if you are over the ages of 35 and you're male, you might want to get a medical clearance. Certainly, if you if you haven't had a um, active lifestyle in the past, um, or if you're over the age of 40 for women. So certainly go and see a GP if that's something that's, that you want to start and you haven't done it in the past. So the national recommendations are around 30 minutes a day on most days of the week. And, I've, I've, and that's for weight maintenance. Looking at if that is enough, there's certainly guidelines that um, indicate that greater than 60 minutes a day is recommended for weight loss or weight maintenance um, and up to 80 minutes a day. So it is considerably more than that. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the tips um, for weight loss and maintenance. So lifestyle based increased activity for long term and that can be, you know, I've, I've got a big slide on, on activity types but that can be something as simple as parking the car, you know, in the second car park and walking to work and to and from work a little bit further in the morning. So incorporating that, taking the stairs rather than with those sorts of incidental activity. So other than weight loss, there are additional benefits that can be gained from regular exercise. And it's been shown in the literature that if even people that exercise regularly and don't lose weight it can have other physiological benefits as well. One of the big things that we try to do in clinic is individualise um, activity and what I mean by that is actually getting the, the individual to discover what things they would like to do and set their goals around that. So I've got a few examples there and these are some that have come from our clients that have come there, um, while they're not, you know, looking at the gym, certainly personal trainers and using exercise physiologists have been quite helpful. Um, you know, having organised group sessions, you know, walking groups, uh, you know, doing pump and, and other exercises that are at the gym, uh, as well as a lot of our clientele have found that the pool's been quite helpful. Um, so swimming, walking, you know, doing circuit classes and aerobics and all that sort of stuff in there is going to be quite helpful. As I said, increasing incidental activities um, can be one way of doing it. Dancing in front of the television at night, excellent way to burn off simple calories. Um, if that's something that you're into. You know, but simple things like, you know, taking your pet for a walk, uh, going for a bike ride, you know, or run if you're that energetic, bushwalking, bird watching, things that people can incorporate into their lifestyle have been quite um, beneficial for them and also ended up with quite good results with change. So again, go to the Tai Chi. One of the big things that, um, that we look at is monitoring that activity. So getting people to focus on are they getting half an hour in or an hour or two hours or however much they do. But again, trying to look at increasing that slowly over a long period of time. So looking at the things like how often they do it, how long they do it for, and how hard, and trying to change those over time. 
And if they're having difficulty with that, you know, referring them on to the private, uh, the, the other health professionals that might be able to assist. So looking at ways of filling up without excessive energy, I know if you've all had your, your entrees, so hopefully we'll see some main meals coming up now. Um, so eating regular meals, one of the big things that we've seen, and it's, and it's in the literature too, is that um, skipping meals, you know, missing breakfast for example, something as simple as uh, skipping breakfast can then relate to overeating throughout the day, um, decreasing metabolism uh, and finding it difficult then to maintain a healthy balanced uh, intake of nutrition throughout the day. So one of the things that we do is we use hunger as a cue and we try to get people to link in to, the, to those senses that we did earlier on, that exercise we did earlier on, um, as a cue for eating and I'll show you a little scale later on that is quite helpful. Uh, looking at decreasing sugar and um, foods high in sugar. So certainly there is some research that indicates you know, high sugar in doesn't affect society, satiety as well as having um, lower sugar type foods and foods that have more um, fibre in them and foods that have protein in them, etc. So there's there's some research in that as well. So there's more of a consumption as well as you go. Tend to find that you eat more of those types of foods as well. Including carbohydrates with each meal has been indicated to help with um, decreasing energy intake. Saying that, depending on what you put on that carbohydrate, can obviously impact on that energy as well. Looking at foods that increase your satiety or fullness is certainly helpful and they can be, um, as I said, low GI or low glycemic index type foods um, or carbohydrates and certainly I'll, I'll put a slide up and talk about that a little bit more. But adding protein and fibre can also help with that satiety as well, so not just looking at that. And making sure that you get plenty of water, because that's certainly one of the things that um, i found that clients can, that don't get a great deal feel like they're hungry all the time. So certainly dealing with that, this is from a clinical sense, is dealing with that has actually had a really good impact on how they can manage their food as well. So they tend not to eat as often when they're well hydrated. So talking about GI and that glycemic index, for those people who don't know much about glycemic index, um, basically there's a, a, a scale of um, 1 to 100 if you like, where they rank food at the rate at which it's broken down and releases into the bloodstream. So the foods that are quite high and have that higher ranking of around um, uh, up in the 70s to 100 um, have a blood sugar response uh, in the red there, or a high glycemic, which is a quite a quick peak or fast peak and then a, slow, and a fast decline as well. So over the two, two hour period you can see that there's quite a peak in trough in there as well. So on the other side of that is that low glycemic foods have a slower release of the sugars from that type of food and that can be for a number of reasons that they are low in sugar or they could contain more fibre. So certainly that slower release has been indicated in a way of managing that satiety and, and reducing the, the energy that is consumed. So that's certainly my strategy we can use. The reason that I've put this slide up here is to give you a bit of an indication that there are in each of these categories a whole range of different types of um, glycemic loaded foods. So low glycemic foods less than 55, hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, medium 56 to 69 and high being 70 and above. But what I wanted to point out, which is quite interesting, if you have a look in the cereals, you'll see porridge there is in all three. So just looking at porridge alone, I mean that can be quite confusing. 
there are different types of porridge. For example, your instant <coughs> porridge will have a different glycemic effect than your rolled oats. So having just a simple choice change in there can certainly affect your satiety, so your fullness. So then again, hopefully lead into reducing that energy intake. So simple strategies around that can be helpful. Looking at different types of breads, certainly. Um, and again, fruits and vegetables, it can be done on all, all of those healthy sort of food groups that we've looked at before. One of the things that is quite interesting when we look at this, and, and I guess a little bit of a cautionary note, that there are a lot of low GI type foods that can be quite high in energy. So, you know, for example, a Mars bar could be quite low, but it does contain a lot of energy. So it's, it's important to make sure that when we're using these tools that the education is provided. And as I said earlier, this is not an individual thing, but just to highlight the strategy that can be helpful. So we did that little exercise earlier, the eating with awareness. And one of the things that um, certainly we try to to help our clients discover a little bit more is linking back into those cues around hunger. So, you know, working out those signals that the body sends out to us that when we're a little bit hungry, that gurgling feeling, that, that feeling of cramping, hopefully that's probably a little bit far past hungry, it might be a bit more like starving, but that rumbling, that sensation, um, and obviously the more that uh, we ignore that, push ourselves over to the nausea, lightheadedness, difficulty concentrating. And I'm pretty sure they're very common things that we hear with people that miss their breakfast in the morning, come about lunchtime. Those are some of those um, symptoms that they're reporting. And certainly if that continues, that we get down into that zero starving area, you know, leading to becoming hypoglycemic, becoming shaky, you know, having no energy to do any of the things that you want to do, and again, being quite lethargic in, in your activity. So again, if you're trying to do more activity, it's sort of working against you in that sense. So by linking into that awareness, and, um, catching it a little bit earlier, and trying to eat more so around this getting empty, the rumbling, um, rather than the shaking, decreased energy levels and that um, starving sort of s stage uh, certainly can help with maintaining that energy intake throughout the day rather than the overfilling or eating excessively. And that's been indicated and reported on time and time again. People that miss breakfast tend to overeat later on in the day. Um, and again, one of the other issues associated with that is that uh, the choice of food can be quite poor as well. So, you know, looking at going for the, the snack foods rather than um, the healthy options. So that exercise around mindful eating is also uh, something that you can take home and look at the things that you do on a daily basis. So trying to recognise some of the behaviours associated around that hunger. Why do we eat? Are we bored when we eat? You know, is it that we're stressed out, we sit at our computer desks and, you know, we've got the chocolate jar next to us and we eat um, for that reason. Is it emotional eating, you know, I feel bad, you know, sex in the city type thing where we sit there and eat the whole ice cream <laughs> at night time because of those issues. They're real issues, but certainly, um, being aware of those things is important as well and that can also then help understand some of those behaviours and maybe looking at changing those behaviours. Taking time out for eating, I know in this day and age we're all time poor, but certainly sitting down would be a, um, you know, not driving the car, uh, running from there over here, eating on the way. Those things can certainly help as well. Thinking about how quickly you eat, and um, hopefully you guys will be eating soon, and you can start to think about that as well. 
and just some of those simple practical tips like putting your knife and fork down in between, you know, um, in between mouthfuls can be really simple strategies that have really good outcomes for, for individuals. Um, paying attention to what you eat and you've had a little bit of a, a spill on paying attention to your strawberries today. Um, and removing some of the associations, some of the distractions, uh, you know, like computers and TV and, um, and certainly those associations, like every time that I sit down in front of the television, I've got to have my something to eat. And then before I know it, I finish the packet of chips and I didn't even recognise that I'd eaten them. So some of those associations can become learned associations, like the Pavlov dog theory, and the bell salivation. Um, and certainly being aware of that is, can be helpful in changing those behaviours um, and again reducing that energy load. So one of the things that we look at in our clinic is certainly ways of becoming your own lifestyle manager. You know, most things that we do in life that we have a plan for, and I think um, your weight and managing your weight certainly is one of the things that can be helpful there too. So developing your own action plan, and certainly we will work on facilitating that with our clients on a daily basis. Being organised for change. I mean, certainly that's one of the big things that we see um, from time to time that um, that people just don't know where to start. It's very difficult. I'm not sure where to start with you know changing my behaviours. Um, so trying to get some organisation set around uh, you know organising your exercise and organising your meals and, and it brings me to. to one of, the, one of my clients came in a couple of weeks ago and, and all they had for dinner three nights a week was pasta with a tomato sauce, just straight out of the bottle. Because they were so time poor that it was very difficult for them to organise dinner at night. So a part of, out of that we thought, well, what way could we get around that? And she came up with a plan of just organising a uh, cook on Sunday. So she just cooked a couple of meals, something as, as simple as a vegetarian lasagna, and just froze it for those meals. So she changed her behaviour very simply, um, but it had a big impact on her nutritional intake from that. So rather than having pasta and tomato sauce, she now had a healthy option that she could have. Um, so that was you know, a simple strategy, but a really good outcome for that individual. So being mo uh, motivated um, is certainly one of the things that comes up time and time again. People find it quite difficult to stay motivated. Um, so looking at ways to stay motivated is certainly uh, important and we'll work through that with our clients on a daily basis. And that can be as simple as, you know, at least trying to have a positive approach every day when you get up. Today I'm going to stay positive and have my healthy lifestyle approach. Um, educating yourself is important, so seeking out the right information. As I said earlier, you know over 500 plus um, diets that are out there at the moment, and the information that we're bombarded with and that people are bombarded with um, is not always as accurate as it should be. So certainly making sure that the information that you get is from a reliable, credible source. So looking at um, you know, the, obviously the professionals will be a good start. Um, and, and making sure that if you're looking at things on websites that they're from reputable sites as well. Seeking support and encouragement um, from people around you. And, uh, and certainly rewarding the things that you do well. So, you know, reward success. I, don't, I think um, certainly that's one thing that can be helpful in the long term. Uh, becoming a student, studying these things, asking questions, seeking out uh, the professionals that can help. Finding out what works for in other individuals, how they've overcome those motivational barriers, um, 
um, can be helpful. Um, also, what, what we found is that um, asking a lot of questions to the right people has really benefited those individuals. So not being afraid to ask the questions um, is, is, is a matter of B, but certainly asking them. Um, experimenting with change. Certainly all the scientists in the, the room would say if something's not working, maybe you change the, the way that you do it and see if you can get a different result. So, and that's no different for somebody that's trying to manage their weight. If the way that they've been doing it time and time again, dieting for example, if that's not working, maybe a, a new approach is, is something that could work for them. <laughs> So the last point is surrounding yourself with the best team. And it's quite difficult if you've got this conflict between uh, what you want to achieve and what the people around you want you to achieve. So certainly trying to get you know, family, family, friends, other health professionals, um, you know, people that are like-minded and surrounding yourself with those. Those people are quite, can be quite helpful as well. One of the things that we do every time that we see an individual is sit down with them and make sure that we set some goals. And I think this is certainly something that probably isn't done as often as it could be. Um, and we do set goals in other areas. You know, it might be in our academic life. It might be might be for just our shopping list from a day-to-day -day basis, but certainly um, for your lifestyle change, sitting, setting realistic goals, or how I would like to put it in that SMART acronym, is simple, measurable, achievable goals, things that are appealing and realistic. So certainly, um, you know, setting goals that are unrealistic are really destined to fail quite quickly. Um, but also having an outcome within at the time that you want to achieve that goal within. So, um, and keeping that relatively short, but also on that point, setting mid term and long term goals as well is quite helpful. So, and making sure that they link up so that your short term goals link into your mid term goals, into your long term goals. So they've all got um, relevance. And then, as I said earlier, making sure they're rewarding uh, for achievement, no matter how small it is. So this is one of the areas, looking at barriers that get in the way for people, individuals, uh, that stop people from achieving their goals. And certainly, um, they can be looked at as, they could be behavioural barriers, they could be emotional barriers, they could be situational barriers, um, or they could just be the timing's not quite right. So, looking at things like, uh, is the individual or are you ready for change is certainly important. Looking at how important making those lifestyle changes are, uh, whether or not the individual or you are quite um, fearful of not being able to achieve it or, or letting people down. Um, and as I said earlier, making sure that planning, that you've got good planning, that you've got support around your planning, um, and that all of the goals that you set are quite realistic. So, you know, sometimes setting unrealistic goals becomes a barrier in itself. Identifying um, food uh, rules and moral bags that we tend to put on food, good, bad types of foods, is um, important to sort of identify. And some of the emotions that are wrapped up um, as well as what your confidence level of achieving that lifestyle change or that behavioural change might be. Roadblocks is what I refer to as the 
point where you get to uh, trying to achieve your, your set goal, uh, but for some reason you've, you've found a sticking point um, and the individual tends to go the, the all or none theory. Well, it's all too hard. Okay, I'm not going to do it any longer. So alternatively, alternatively to that, um, looking at alternate routes, so other ways of still achieving that goal. So whether or not it's a, a physical goal, so if increasing activity, um, and looking at what roadblocks might get in the way. So it might be as simple as changing the activity type, or it may be that we need to look at exploring uh, the issues around uh, body image, for example, and how that's stopping that individual from going and doing that activity. So trying to identify what those roadblocks are and then finding the best assistance around that. So whether or not if it's a behavioural issue, maybe that's where we need to look at it, including or that individual needs to be referred on to psychology um, or if it's an exercise issue they might just need a little bit more help surrounding their um, exercise goals through physiotherapy because of injuries or other things like that. So it's trying to identify them and, and work out ways of um, uh, still achieving those goals or modifying them so they can achieve that. One of the things that uh, we do quite regularly is looking at ways of monitoring change. So you'll see right down the bottom, the first one uh, that I've left down the bottom is scales. And certainly that's the, probably the number one way that most people monitor change. We tend to look at using scales um, as probably the less preferred choice. While there is evidence that people that use scales uh, or monitor their weight on a regular basis maintain weight and, and, and lose weight, um, certainly there are other ways of monitoring it. And certainly people that have issues around self-confidence and body image and uh, using scales is something that we would avoid in that circumstance. So other ways that we would look at monitoring change is looking at people's energy levels. So certainly if they're now starting breakfast, for example, uh, they're eating regularly, having a healthier dietary intake, uh, and then certainly the reports that we get back is that their energy levels are better. So that's a quite a good outcome of their lifestyle change. So looking at all the other things that they might be uh, improving, so there could be things like their sleep's improved, so you know, uh, less tired through the day, improved skin, for example, uh, hair, nails, all of those things can be reported and, and be looked at rather than whether or not they've succeeded on a number on their scale. Having a better awareness about their healthy eating and drinking, so certainly if that's what their goals were, looking at that and uh, seeing whether or not they've been able to maintain that over time is, is quite a good one. Um, looking at what behaviours they may have changed or the individual has changed. So things like, you know, turning the television off at night time while they're eating dinner, eating more slowly, being a little bit more mindful around their eating. Um, all of those things can then have an effect on their weight and also have an effect on their lifestyle as well. So again, body measurements could be one way. And one way that we use is looking at clothes, clothes sizes, tape measures, um, so there are other ways of, of looking at change and also looking at success, the way that someone you know, rates their success other than that number. So whether or not changes in eating different types of food, so uh, that can be a huge change for someone that's you know, only been eating uh, carbohydrates for the last couple of months or they've restricted one type of food for a long time or they've got phobias about eating other types of food. So that can be certainly one way that they can look at monitoring that. Looking at uh, stress levels, I say 
that stress can be indicated in weight gain. So if they're able to improve their stress and manage it better, um, that certainly can be associated with having a better diet because they're getting a better balance of those vitamins and minerals um, on a daily basis as well. And looking at some of the other physical changes uh, like sugar levels, blood glucose levels, cholesterol levels, are they able to, to manage that? So, um, or it could be as simple as looking at how they're linked in with that hunger scale uh, and if they're able to reduce the amount of that non-hungry type eating. Um, so, as you can see, uh, there, there are a huge number of alternates than the scales for assessing and monitoring an individual's uh, success when we're looking at weight maintenance and weight loss. While we as clinicians like to have the numbers, certainly that's not always uh, beneficial for individuals. So some of the things that, I'll take it back to a bit of a practical sense of, of home and what things can do at home that do make a difference and have been reported to make a difference. And, um, and I always think of a, a client that I saw that used to have deep fried everything basically three times a day. So they would have fry up in the morning and then lunchtime they'd have deep fried lunch and then for dinner they'd have deep fried. So something as simple as then changing the way they prepare, prepare their food so from that deep frying to something as simple as stir frying, cutting out a lot of the energy that they were consuming. So there's a whole range of, of ways and uh, strategies that we put in place around uh, lifestyle changes at home. So you can see, uh, you know, from deep frying to steaming to microwaving, you know, from baking to grilling, all, all quite healthy choices that you can prepare at home and do that can make a difference from um, if that becomes a, an issue that's been identified. So one of the other strategies that we use is looking at um, ingredients and, and looking at swapping some of the ingredients. So for example, you know, using some reduced energy type foods um, in the dairy category instead of having full fat milk, having reduced fat milk for some people. Depending on if that's an issue and the vol volumes of milk consumed, you know, if somebody's you know, only having a little bit of full fat milk in their cup of tea twice a day, is it a big issue? Probably not. So certainly they're the things assessing that, um, but there are options that, that we can do that are trying to reduce the, the amount of saturated fat through the types of cooking oils that might be used or the spreads that might be used, um, uh, some avenues that we can look at. Um, meat, poultry, you know, removing your fat, we've heard a lot of these, taking the skin off before you cook. Uh, your chicken, for example, reduce the fat content of that, reduce the energy intake of that. Um, but again, having that moderation, so a small amount of skin may not be a big issue if you only have it once every two months. So it's looking at it in that context of um, when it's consumed and how much. So again, with the pastries, using different types can have an effect on energy as well. So one of the other strategies that we use uh, with our clients is looking at a plate model, and you guys have all had a bit of a plate model today. I don't know if it exactly fit. It was probably pretty close. So, if you look at that plate, you know, half of, the, half of your plate at night or lunchtime when you're sitting down and having a meal, if that's around vegetables and salads and, you know, lots of colours in there, uh, then you can tell you're pretty much on a, 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 a good choice when you've got that. With some carbohydrates, as I talked about with that low GI, whole grains, increased fiber, it's quite important, and some proteins as well to help with that satiety and fill you up, less likely to overeat. And as I put down there, to aim for a rainbow plate or a technicolor plate, any of those sorts of things, 
And I'll give you an example of what a rainbow plate is. Hopefully you've seen one of that was in front of you all today. So this is a rainbow plate on the right, I think, on the left. And this, this was a project that I did a couple of years ago looking at, um, looking at the intake of athletes. And this was at the same service, and you can see that there's a huge variation between intake. So some, some individuals were choosing you know, quite a nice, colourful plate, whereas on the other side, the, the less of a rainbow plate uh, was sliced meat and some Vegemite um, on whole, whole grain, unless they had whole grain bread. So a big variation, and, and you can see that, that the difference between the two is that um, the one that the rainbow plate, you can see the colour, you can see the vitamins and minerals, and you can see all of that there. Whereas if you look at that, um, the Devon on that Vegemite, um, you really look, it looks quite limited in what you're going to be provided with. So it's quite a good visual cue that we use um, to help individuals get a sense of what is a healthy option. So I'll just go through a few of the tips that um, can help with weight control. Number one, making a plan. I've said that a couple of times today. Developing your own plan. And that might be in conjunction with a health professional. Certainly if you're struggling with making a plan, that's quite quite important to, to seek advice and help around that. Um, committing to change in your lifestyle. So that's important because you know the first step is always the hardest, they say. So but starting slowly and not trying to change everything and set those goals too high, too unrealistic, but making those small changes over time are uh, more likely to be sustained long term than trying to go down that diet cycle by eliminating a lot of things out of there, being restrictive um, and not being able to sustain it over a long period of time. Be patient. Change does take time. Um, so, you know, if you ever see that uh, certainly those claims around you know, losing 30 kilos in three days, then you probably think that that's a bit hard to achieve. Well, it probably is going to be too hard to achieve. So. You know, making those small changes, setting realistic goals and trying to attain those over time uh, is going to set you, um, set it in a way that's going to be sustained over a long period of time, more likely to be sustained over a long period of time. So as I said, smart goals are really important. Um, you know, simple, measurable, attainable or attractive reliable, um, realistic, sorry, and um, in a time frame. Uh, and as I said earlier, long and short term. So trying to link them together so that they work. Um, and that can be around diet, exercise, lifestyle changes, work, stress reduction, a whole range of things that, as I said before, it is complex and there's a lot of things that can be addressed um, to help with weight control, not just uh, diet and exercise. Uh, reduce the energy density of your food, and I've been through that a bit today, ways and, um, and strategies around reducing that. So looking at those things, being mindful around your eating, linking back into those hunger cues, um, and trying to reduce some of the, the high fat, high sugar type options as well as alcohol. Um, as I've said before, alcohol has been related to weight gain. Eating with awareness, as I said. Increasing activity levels. Um, that can be as simple as uh, doing a little bit more walking to and from work, uh, taking the stairs, incidental activity, uh, putting the remote control down and actually getting up and changing the channel on the television. Uh, it's a novel approach, I know, but it's certainly, now that we've got more than four channels, it does make a difference. Um, can make a difference. 
identifying what things work for you um, is certainly one of the things. And also identifying what doesn't work and then changing it, looking at different approaches um, to, to the same issue. And getting around those roadblocks as I like to put it. If it's not working, as I said, change it. Look at the strategy. A lot of people look at if it doesn't work, that they fail. And, and certainly, we don't, I don't take that approach. And if, if it doesn't work, the strategy hasn't worked, we need to look at another strategy. And so that's certainly one of the issues um, that people get wrapped up in that um, we try to avoid. So seeking support, there is a lot of support out there. Dietitians, obviously, I've got a bias in that department. Um, but you know, there's, there's health coaching programs, there's community programs, you know, linking in with your family and friends that are supportive, you know, looking at exercise options and also psychology um, if you find those barriers that are associated with behavioural and emotional issues, then certainly linking in with those. So, in summary, choose your food and wisely, reduce the amount of high energy options, eating with awareness, it's very important. Incorporate some low GI foods as an option that can help with fullness, and I said protein is another way, fibre is another way. Um, aiming to achieve and maintain a healthy lifestyle opposed to a healthy weight. Certainly a healthy lifestyle can have the benefit of attaining a healthy weight. Um, setting realistic goals and smart style goals. Um, eating and drinking can make a difference to your health if it's done healthily. And eating's about variety, including wide range of foods um, and as I've pointed out a couple of times today, colourful foods is a good indicator that you're getting a good healthy array of vitamins and minerals and foods um, and food is other than the energy that it provides, it's about enjoyment as well, so looking at food without those moral tags good and bad and enjoying it in that sense too, enjoying it with your friends. Having, it, having food and fluid in moderation and making the changes that suit you as an individual or an individual um, that can be maintained for a long term or lifetime is certainly the approach and what our end goal is here at the clinic. So if you haven't made changes, today might be a good day to start. <laughs>